writing things down or drawing things out forces you to bring resolution to whatever it is you're looking at because you're forced to write it out. You're forced to draw it out. What is it really? You can't bullshit it at this point. And that requires for you to really zoom in when it's really hard to do that. That means you didn't really think about it that clearly. It's really important for anyone starting to do something to be very clear about how they're going to do something. When you want to try to make everything perfect, sometimes what that does is that distracts you on the minor details. You have to understand from people who are more well-versed in that area than you are, how to use capital, how to control capital, when to hold back, when not to spend money, or when to be aggressive and hedge. This is an art. It's absolutely an art if you're going to do something to have self-awareness. I think that's something that I've been able to develop. I wouldn't even be able to tell you how. Um, but I feel like that is one of my strengths. Hey everyone, and welcome to The Essence of Investing, where we explore the story, strategies, wit, and wisdom of investors from across the Asia region and beyond. I'm your host, Jonathan Reckman. My guest today is the one and only Justin Yang, entrepreneur, investor, and host of the Honest Drink podcast. He was kind enough to invite me to record this interview, as well as many others, in the Honest Drink studio in Shanghai. In this episode, we cover Justin's incredible story of launching a consumer fashion brand in China, the fundamentals of strategy, operations, finance, and creativity. And we ask ourselves the critical question for all mid-career professionals. Where the hell did my dreams go? Please listen, like, share, give feedback, and most of all, enjoy. Justin, you are among many things. You are a man of many identities and roles, but three that I know are you are an entrepreneur, an investor, and a podcaster. And I wanted to ask you to reflect or evaluate in your experience, what are the similarities and differences between those activities? Oh, wow. Right off the bat, Jonathan. Look at you. That's actually a really good question. I think um, I'm going to go with similarities first. That's what jumped off to me. I think it's persistence. It's doing something, I think, in the face of failure. Um, but pushing through anyway. I think that's the common ground that all three of those things require. Because when you're starting off, you just suck. Whether it's business or a podcast or some investment choice, um, like you're just really bad at it. And, uh, and no one wants really anything to do with you. <laughs> but just believing in it and believing in your vision, pushing through. Sounds cheesy, but um, I think persistence is crucial if you want to get anywhere in those three things. You also hear that flexibility, adaptive, you know, adaptability, the ability to pivot is important. How do you know when to persevere in one direction and when to pivot in another? Whether it's in content or in building a business or in investing, how do you know when to push forward and when to cut your losses and, you know, do something else? I don't think there's any one answer. I think it's different probably for everybody and in the context of whatever it is they're doing. But I, I think it probably boils down to self-awareness. I mean, again, like, I, let me just caveat, I'm no expert on any of these things. I, I see myself as very much just an amateur playing around with um, different things I've done, right? That's, that's almost how I viewed myself. I think it has a lot to do with self-awareness. Being self-aware, not only of yourself, but how you're affecting whatever project you're on, how that's affecting you, kind of the two-way street of it all. I guess being able to zoom out. Oftentimes, I think whenever we're doing something, especially if it's something we really care about, we get so bogged down and caught up in the minutia of it all and the details, because when something's really important to you, all of a sudden, the details feel so important. Everything feels so important, like life or death. And that kind of forces us to zoom in when we sometimes should zoom out, take a macro picture, take a bird's eye view, I guess, of things, and objectively see what's happening, where it's going. 
And even once you get there, having kind of the balls to to make changes, like and that's that's something I think is not spoken about enough in terms of one is knowing that you need to make a change, especially big changes, changes that maybe not everyone will agree with, changes that might even hurt in the short term, but it's the willingness and conviction to do it anyway. And how do you get yourself over that hump to make that, pull the trigger, so to speak? Uh, that's really tough. Knowing it, I think, is not so tough. Being aware, everyone can be aware, right? Some more than others. But uh, actually putting it into action is a whole different beast. I like anything that involves zooming in and out of the macro and the micro. And something that you just described made me think, we have to zoom in to do something right, but we have to zoom out to do the right thing, which is to say, directionally, strategically, you know, we need to kind of take a step back, but operationally, executionally, we need to be, you know, really micro oriented. Can you give an example from your career of a time where you had to adjust the lens, so to speak? I, first, I want to touch on kind of what you said about zooming and zooming out. And I really agree with that. And as you were saying that, a visual came to mind and is kind of being stuck in a maze or a labyrinth. And you need to find the clues to get out. So you're going to zoom in. You're going to look for the little clues, look for the little details while you're stuck. What's on the walls? What's on the ground? What can you see? And that's helpful and it's needed for sure. But then it also really, really helps if you were able to zoom out and get a bird's eye view of the maze. I mean, just imagine that if you were able to do that, if you had that tool, how much that would help get you out of a situation like that. And oftentimes we're actually able to zoom out and we just forget to, and or we don't know how. So that, that kind of visual really came to my mind as you were talking and kind of put things into perspective for me. Sometimes we're in an escape room. Yeah. And sometimes we're in a maze yeah. or probably we're always in both. And the escape room demands that you're paying really detailed attention to every clue on every wall. And the maze, you know, the labyrinth demands that you zoom out and, and look beyond, you know, the hedge that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. Can you do both at the same time or do you have to do, you have to like, take turns? Is it, is it sort of consecutive? It's like, I'm going to go into my details mode now and then I'm going to step back and zoom out. Or can you find some sort of flow state where you're, you're like soaring above the labyrinth and attentive to every detail in the escape room and just like, you've got it all. I, I can't, personally, I can't. Maybe there's someone out there that can. Um, I, I can't. I have to do one or the other. But I don't think there's anything wrong with that, right? It's like you can focus on one. Just be sure you're doing both. Yeah. And being intentional about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. We get caught up in so much of all the other baggage, I think, that comes with doing any meaningful project. And sometimes, as corny as this sounds, again, we kind of forget why we're doing it. And we kind of lose perspective on what's really happening, especially when you're so invested in something. That investment can be personally, emotionally, financially, or whatever that is, right? And that comes with its own baggage and its own um, blinders. To maybe overextend this metaphor of, of a lens zooming, I think, you know, when you see really experienced photographers, it seems like they're doing everything manually, mm -hmm. adjusting the focus manually yeah. and intentionally. And then, you know, simpletons like me, we just like a point and click autofocus. And I think most humans we, on this macro and micro kind of zooming, we tend to default to autofocus and sometimes our autofocus is very good. And so we wind up with kind of like a middle blurry picture on everything. We're not getting all the details to be operationally effective. We're not getting the bigger picture to, to have a you know broader sense of our lives. And so we're just sort of stuck on the shitty autofocus. Yeah. And then yeah. it takes mastery, like, you know, a photographer learning to actually, you know, turn the dials and work the lens right to be able to intentionally zoom in and zoom out. And, and maybe you're right. Maybe as humans, we can never be on both planes at once, but we can be more thoughtful and more in control of where we're zooming in, what level we're, we're dialing into, 
and why we're doing it in a certain circumstance. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I don't even think I would even disagree on the mastery of it. I think it's just like what you said, the intentionality. You know, going with that metaphor, just put your hands on the lens and turn the dial to manually focus. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. It's just being intentional about it. You don't doesn't take any special skill, in my opinion. So I'm gonna I'm gonna press you for a story again. Give me an example of a time where you've either zoomed in or zoomed out with intention. Oh, geez. No one's putting me on the spot, Jonathan. I mean, I think you know a little bit about it, but um, you know, kind of like one of the past businesses I was involved in was a fashion retail business. Um, this was several years ago in China. Uh, the concept was to do a fast fashion retail chain, the likes of a Uniqlo, H&M, you know, stuff like that, but to make it, um, to be like a domestic Chinese brand. And our initial strategy was to open up chains in the second, third tier cities in China as they were developing. The kind of thought behind that was out there in these cities, we can be on an even playing field as the Uniqlo's and H&M's of the world. Because out there, those brands were also new to those, to those consumers. So that was the initial strategy. We did that for a few years. We had, our, we had some wins, but we ultimately, um, I ultimately decided to shut it down. That was one of the toughest decisions in my life um, because that was my first real attempt at stepping out on my own and launching a business, being a real entrepreneur, um, all the things that I envisioned I would be doing, all the things that I envisioned would be successful about who I was. And so making that decision, I think, to shut down that company and let go of all the employees, many of whom had been there with us from the early days, um, and you build relationships with them and they've worked really, really hard with you. That was really tough. And so to answer your question, that is an example where in order to come to a decision like that, after so many years, after so much money has been sunken into the business, that's not a, de a decision you can possibly make without zooming out, without seeing the entirety of what you're doing and having everything into consideration. That was a moment, I think it was kind of those like come to Jesus moments where I had to zoom out and look objectively at the business and see it for what it was, not for what I hoped it was gonna be or what I was making up in my mind and justifying it could be. And I realized, I think, at that time, the foundations of the business itself just weren't solid enough. We patched up too many things along the way in the early days, kind of just putting band-aids over cracks in the foundation and over and over again. And ultimately we got to a point where we grew to a certain size where that just wasn't, the foundation couldn't hold us anymore. And I felt it crumbling that decision had to be made, but I really had to zoom out. Um, I really had to just walk away and just look at it without putting myself in the picture. I think for a long time, I mean, I could have probably made that decision even sooner, maybe, maybe. Um, but I would push it off because I was in denial for a while. It was a, I think a reality I just, was, didn't want to face, obviously, but you kind of have to. That process of zooming out and looking at it objectively, taking yourself and your dreams and aspirations and identity and the sunk cost that's already in there mm -hmm. and putting that aside and, you know, analyzing it more objectively in really practical terms, what, what did that look like? Was that just a series of kind of met it, you know, business conversations that you had either with your partners or with yourself? Was it, you know, you go away on a, on a hike one day and try and, you know, find some other perspective? How, how do you kind of almost mechanically, like, how do yeah. you put yourself in that position to be able to look at something differently from another higher perspective? I think it's accumulation of a lot of small moments, brief moments. 
Um, certainly, you have a lot of meetings with other people in the business, and through those meetings, you get a better picture of what's happening in all corners of the business. You know, even when you're on top, there's you have blind spots within your own company. Everyone does until you start really talking to all the people in that company. Then you start uncovering a lot of dark corners. And I'm not saying there were so many dark corners, but I'm saying certainly talking to people helped inform me. But it's a lot of brief moments, even really simple things as the drive to the office every morning. Something as simple as that, on my way to the office or on my way back home. It's just being intentional about putting your head in the space of thinking about the overall picture. When I'm at home, before I go to bed, I mean, at that time, it was really all I can think about. But it's what you choose to think about, right? So it's how you zoom in, how you zoom out. And for me, all those brief moments of whether I'm in the car, whether I'm at home, whether I'm sitting on the airplane, it's taking in all those brief opportunities to kind of be mindful about zooming out, be mindful of trying to see the overall picture instead of being so caught up in the nitty gritty immediate tasks or urgent matters and emergencies that need to be put out, right? all these little fires when you're running a business. You can easily get distracted by that and that consumes you easily. Um, I think anyone who runs a business can understand and relate to that. But it's also making sure you take those brief moments. So I think it was an accumulation of a lot of that. And then one day it kind of just clicked. And it also helps not just to think about it mentally, but to actually draw it out on paper. And I mean like literally draw it out. So like what I would sometimes do is have a big sheet of white paper and I would just as an exercise, draw out structurally the business on a piece of paper, kind of like an organizational chart, right? where the money's coming in, where it's going, what does it look like, how many apartments. I just draw bubbles, I use boxes, I use lines, and you kind of just map everything out. And doing that is like the difference between having like, you know, sometimes we think we have like a really funny joke in our head. But then when you actually say it out loud, you realize, wait a minute, like I don't, it's not even worded correctly. It, it doesn't, the punchline doesn't come through. People aren't getting it. It's not even as funny as I thought, as I had it in my head. Putting it down and drawing things out on paper with your business or any project you're doing is to me kind of like the equivalent of that. And that really helps as well. And then you're, because you're forced to write it out. You're forced to draw it out. What is it really? You can't bullshit it at this point. You can't use fiction anymore. That points out a lot of kind of um, weaknesses or, you know, pain points. It also can point out a lot of good things as well. Yeah. Can you do the same exercise as an investor or podcaster? Oh, for sure. I mean, this applies to it all. I've done this with the podcast. Lately, I started um, and it was harder than it looks. It took a while. I sat down with my co-host, Howie, and we started like mapping everything out because we're trying to get reorganized with the podcast as well because it's also getting to a space where like, okay, now we kind of have to like, take it seriously, especially after we met you and you gave us all this inspiration to like kind of really go forward with it and to treat it like a real thing. We've been starting to get more serious with it. Yeah. So yeah, of course this, this applies to everything. It even applies to family life, personal things. Yeah. I think there's something about putting things down on paper that doesn't let you hide. I can easily spend a very happy afternoon mapping out what my business will look like in little boxes and bubbles on a piece of paper. And it is a helpful exercise, but also it can become this sort of intellectual just exercise. It's, it's like a fun, you know, puzzle, but I could do that all day or all month or all year. It's, it's actually, you know, removed a little bit from, I get what from you're the saying. actual work. I totally and, get what and, you're saying. Now. Just to loop it back. It's like, if you're trying to get out of an escape room and you just become like fascinated with your macro lens and, you know, look how far I can zoom out. You can, you, you can zoom out all you want. You're still in the little box. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 No, I totally get what you mean because there's sometimes like, for example, going back to kind of putting things on paper, writing it down. Right. And even going earlier to what you were saying, writing things down or drawing things out forces you to bring resolution to whatever it is you're looking at. 
going back to that camera example, the lens example, right? Sometimes in our heads, it's a general idea, it's a thought, um, it's a basic concept. And we attribute more detail and resolution in our minds to this thing more than there actually might be. You know what I'm saying? So when you're writing it down, sometimes you realize, oh, I have to explain this thing now. I have to describe it. I have to really articulate its function and its role, like as it actually is. And that requires for you to really zoom in and, and bring out all the detail and resolution in something. And sometimes you'll notice that when it's really hard to do that, that means you didn't really think about it that clearly. And it's just more of a vague concept or idea. And so that kind of highlights a lot of um, things that maybe you should be thinking about more or really having to f like flesh out more in your business. Because sometimes to write things out or map things out when it's, let's say it's a fairly complex project you're working on or business or investment, it can take a while to do it. And it might take several hours or it might take the better part of your day even. And when you finally finish doing that, there is a feeling of accomplishment. You feel like, oh, now that I'm done, you know what? I was productive today. I accomplished something. And then because you just spent so long doing that, you take that accomplishment as if you actually solved anything. And I think that goes to more what you're saying in terms of sometimes we just end it right there. And we're like, oh, I finished that task. I accomplished it. I was productive. And then you forget what, do, what the purpose of doing that was. And the work really starts after you draw everything out, after you map everything out, after you have that more, like, more clarity. That's when the work really begins. And sometimes we just stop there thinking we've done it. We've accomplished what we set out to accomplish for today. And that's that. And then we forget about it. So I can understand from that perspective, sometimes we lose sight of the bigger picture or the original point of using these tools. I spent 30 minutes making a really nice to-do list. I'm going to take a break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you'd be surprised a lot of people feel that way. I mean, I do too. Sometimes I get so bogged down in the task, the tool itself, and then you feel like that in itself is an accomplishment. And then you just feel you kind of have this like satisfaction. And then you forget about like the actual, the actual work. I want to go back to your anecdote. And you'd said that after a couple of years, you found the foundations of the company weren't solid. Mm. And I've been thinking a lot about fundamentals recently, uh, both in a business and, you know, us as, as individuals, kind of what are our fundamentals? What are our foundations? What's the best way to get your foundations set while also making real forward progress and, and not just, you know, not, not just doing foundational work? How do you keep those moving in sync? If you've already like kind of on your way in the middle of doing something and then trying to retroactively go back and repair foundational cracks. I think in my personal experience, I think that's near impossible unless you just so happen to have so much capital, so much resource and the time and the luxury to do those things because it, it's going to, it, it's, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you, like literally cost you to do those things. So I think my mistake was going into something without a really clear vision. And that's, that's a little different than having a business plan, something like that. I mean, these are all probably basic things that, you know, people nowadays are very well versed in, um, well understood. You should go in with a business plan, a, a clear strategy to start. Not that that strategy will never change. It surely will. But at least go in so that any pivots and changes you're making later down the road are at least not touching the foundation of what you built. And they're more cosmetic changes. They're, they're more manageable. Because once you start dealing with foundational things, like literally how the business is set up, 
the actual structure of the model itself. The the major owners and, and shareholders, all that stuff. Then it becomes extremely, extremely difficult, if not near impossible, if you don't have just, I think, a lot of time and money to burn on doing that. So I don't personally know of a good way to retroactively make those kind of changes. I think it's really important for anyone starting to do something to be very clear about how they're going to do something and think through it through the big picture and long term of how they want to set these things up and at least make a foundational, like don't get caught up in perfection. Um, when you want to try to make everything perfect, sometimes what that does is that distracts you on the minor details, on the little pixels in the image, all these things that are required to attain perfection, but aren't the most crucial things. So I think when you're starting off, just think, go back to the one-on-one, the basics. Make sure your foundation, make sure your, your, your accounting system, make sure all these basic, basic things are set up really well. And then that will give you, I think, the luxury and freedom later on to make pivots here and there um, without so much of a cost. And it puts you in a position where you have like the lower body strength to, to deal with those kind of changes. Because um, in the case of the fashion retail example I gave, it might have worked out if we just didn't make so many little changes later on. The fact is we were pivoting like every other month. It was insane. We made so many pivots. Pivot this direction, pivot that direction. No, we should be this. No, we should be that now. Oh, this isn't working. We should try this. And that's natural, especially for a startup. You're trying to find your way in the market. You're trying to see and trial and error and see what works. So that all comes natural. It's just that I think we went a little bit overboard with that on top of going back to our foundation. Our foundation wasn't, wasn't strong enough to take on all those momentum changes. And ultimately, I, I saw it all just, I felt it was all just going to come apart. So... So I guess answer your question, I don't know how you can go back, but I just think that puts the onus on making sure when you start something, put the love TLC in those foundations of any business, the basic stuff, and then, um, and then worry about the little things um, and the perfection of it all as you're going. I think that judgment of, at the very beginning, what is really core and foundational and what is the pixels... Uh, is such an important judgment to develop. It's important at any stage, but at the beginning it might be existential. We're both recent, relatively recently new parents, and uh, and so we are are starting these little little things of their own, and you know ultimately they're responsible for their lives, but but we're responsible for their education and, and parenting. I often ask myself. If I see my daughter, uh, who's two and a half, you know, I want her to have good foundations. I want her to get the fundamentals right so that she can then go do whatever she wants. But there's that judgment question again as to it was this a foundational, non-negotiable skill or ability or temperament that like it's really important that we get right early. And what are just like pixels? In my own life, the biggest foundational thing that I'm actually, I would consider is my biggest weakness is the accounting side of things. And these foundational stuff, it's usually the boring stuff, man. Like no one wants to spend all day thinking about, you know, how the accounting system works, how your books work. No one wants to think about how your inventory system works and the warehousing logistics. Like these are all really boring things, but they are literally the arteries and veins of your business. So you have to have those things strong. So for me, it's the accounting knowledge. It's being, it's understanding financials deeper than just the basics, deeper than just accounts payable, you know, stuff like that. I think that is a skill um, that I would press press on my children at an early stage because that's something. Um, I've always been weak in. I never had any formal training in. I didn't really care about it when I was young. 
it would just seem really boring to me. And it's not until later when you actually start doing things, you understand, oh, okay, it, it's, it all boils down to the accounting and understanding how to manage the money. And this has implications, not just in your business or investment, but in your personal life, right? Like, like how are you going to manage the money for your family, for your kids, um, for your business, for your job, for whatever investment you're working on? And it seems like so obvious, like, of course, because at the end of the day, it's all about money and managing money. No, but there's a real art to it. And there's a real deep knowledge that you really have to work at, that you have to understand from people who are more well-versed in that area than you are and really buy into that, the accounting side of things, the financial management, the strategy behind how to use capital um, how to control capital, when to hold back, when not to spend money, or when to be aggressive and hedge. This is an art. It's absolutely an art, and it's something that I've always felt was so difficult for me to understand. You know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs want, don't want to admit that vulnerability because it's shameful. Because as an entrepreneur, like, that's basically what it comes down to, right? So if you're economics game is not strong, you won't really be taken seriously, even as an investor, well, especially as an investor. So to me, that was always a big insecurity of mine. And I don't want my children to be, feel, have that same sense of insecurity I do about that. I want them to be really competent about it. Do you think that's a foundation that everyone needs? Or is that something that, for example, if you as a founding partner aren't strong there, that you can partner with a, you know, a co-founder, um, you know, you're the, the prototypical COO, CFO type, uh, that you can not outsource, but share that burden with somebody, or does everyone in a leadership position need to have a handle on it themselves? I think everyone in a leadership position should have a handle on it. I mean, Hopefully your CFO is better at it than you are, but that doesn't mean you don't know what's going on because you're going to have to communicate with them. They're going to have to communicate with you. You're going to have to understand everything they're conveying and you're going to have to have the ability to spot and back them up on things that they might have not seen or, or uh, miscalculations or just differences in ideology in terms of strategy and being able to have that conversation competently. I think every leader needs to have that. More broadly, to go back to your, uh, your, your question is, I think everybody needs to have that. I think, I think um, financial competency is something, at least for me, growing up in America, we, this wasn't a part of our curriculum. And I was always very envious of a lot of um, some friends I grew up around. And their families were very much like, really kind of schooled them on that. I don't feel I got that same kind of schooling and I didn't really know or care to look for it elsewhere. So I think, I, I, I think the level of financial incompetency is, is a big problem for everybody. And I think it's something we would all need to know, not just leaders. Yeah. And not just if you're running a business, if you're a worker, you're working at some sort of company, you know, you need to know how to manage your own finances too, right? It's, it's, it's all really kind of the same thing in principle, except when it comes to a business or an investment, it gets a little more complicated, but fundamentally it's the same as if you're just managing your private finances. What's a foundation that you've developed that you are proud of where you think you really excel? Ooh. The self-awareness piece of it. I mean, that's big. That's big if you're going to do something to have self-awareness. I think that's something that I've been able to develop. I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you how. Um, but I feel like that is one of my strengths. I feel like the ability to kind of see the bigger picture sometimes is a strength of mine. Um, I've realized that I've been pretty decent at spotting kind of pain points in a lot of things. I mean, what I decide to do about it later varies, depends, but I kind of see 
sometimes how ridiculous some things are set up. And when I go and express that, it sometimes surprises me that other people can't really see it. So I think that's a strength of mine. What do yeah, you see? What do you see that other people don't see? Just how things are set up to not be so efficient and missing the point and things. I've been around people who seem to be really busy and working really hard, but they seem, but everything they're doing to me seems like they're just making the process more complicated. They're adding in quote unquote solutions that I don't think are solving for anything, you know? Um, but in fact, just adding another step in the process. And the whole idea is to reduce the amount of steps in any process. So I think from that perspective, I think maybe that's something I'm okay in. I, I think honestly, I'm more, I think my strengths lie more in the emotional side of doing things. I'm pretty zen. Like I'm a pretty Zen guy. I don't get too carried away positively or negatively. Pretty even keel. <laughs> and and I think that helps me. I think that helps me be able to do a lot of things and to persist in doing something. Because I don't get too down, I don't get too up. And I think that allows me to to stay a little more sober, have a sober mind about things and and just keep trucking along. I don't think that's any small thing either. I think that's really important. How do you translate strengths into strategy? I don't know. I've never done it consciously. And I don't I honestly I'm not even the right person to ask that question. There's so many people who are <laughs> so much better at strategy, you know, and and are well well better versed in just business, investments and all that than I am. Just in your own personal experience, how do you take that those qualities that you just described, that down to earthness, the zenness, the emotional strengths, mm. um, the self awareness, how does that fit into your work today? Well, I think the beauty about that is that it comes without trying because it's just literally part of who you are. So anything you're going to put your time and attention towards, you're going to bring those attributes too. I've never thought consciously about how I'm doing this or what's my strategy for doing it. I think, I think you, everyone, you know, the old saying of, you know, you play to your strengths. And I think that's really true. And I think the going beyond the obvious kind of benefits of doing that, it's also the benefit of not having to try as hard in terms of bringing those strengths to whatever you're doing, because they are just a natural part of you. They're gonna be there no matter what. Even if you tried, they, they'll, they'll still like for them not to be there. They'll still be there. Your strengths are still gonna be there because that's literally who you are. So whatever you're doing, they're gonna be a part of that. And so I think that's the beauty in an idea and concept like playing towards your strengths is that a lot of the benefits are gonna come naturally, and it kind of works like a synergy. You know, it's, it's it is who you are. What's the biggest dream you dare to dream? So I feel like I'm at a stage in my life where I'm, I'm, ex I'm asking myself that question. Like, where did my dreams go? Where do they go? Because I feel like when I was younger, when I was like 20, even when I was 30, man, ah, man, I had the world is your oyster, right? You have the great dreams. You have the ambition. You have the balls to do it. You have everything going for you. And the sky couldn't be any bluer. And the future is bright. Now, I'm not saying like the future is bright. I mean, I'm, I live a very privileged life. I'm, I, I'm appreciative of that. But that energy, that, that spirit of having these dreams, yeah, I don't know where they've gone. And that scares me. That scares me. And I think that more relating to the conversation is I think, I think that greatly impacts in a negative way, how I would do any business or work on any investment right now. Because when you don't have that same spirit about who you are and your future and your dreams, 
that, that, that trickles down to everything you do. And if you're trying to work on a business and you're trying to really push through a, 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 an important investment opportunity or even doing you know, a small project like this podcast, every ounce of that ambition, that drive, that spirit, that energy for the future, that energy going forward, that vision, that dream, matters it matters and it will impact whether it's perceptible to you or not it's going to impact everything you do it's going to impact your investment decisions it's going to impact your ability to drive those decisions forward <laughs> it's really going to impact a lot of it and sometimes we sit in it for so long we forget how it's actually affecting us and affecting our mindset and it's affecting our ability to make these decisions, our willingness to make the decisions, our willingness to make tough decisions, our willingness to make ambitious decisions when needed. It affects a lot of that, you know? It's it's almost like a guy losing his testosterone in a way, right? It's like, it, it affects you. It'll affect the way you think. It'll affect your mentality, right? It, it, it affects, it trickles down to all facets of your life, right? So... I see it in the same way. So yeah, you, you touched on you touched on something I think is really front of mind for me is where did those dreams go? Because it seems like a fun and maybe even childish question, but it's not. And it has real implications to who we are right now as 40 or near 40 year old people kind of heading into the back nine of our lives and trying to figure out how we manage that how we juggle everything and how we keep, you know, how we keep going or do we just shrivel? Um, that has a lot of implications into, into anything you do. Yeah, it's real stuff. Yeah. I like the idea of dreams, not as just an imaginary thing, but as like a real source of energy, like actual energy oh, yeah. that, motivates and powers us to do real things and you're asking you know where do the dreams go it's i'm picturing it like in terms of physical matter uh, you know energy is matter right like where where are they <laughs> yeah. where the fuck my dreams go you know yeah and and with that also a sense of like there's a conservation of energy and a conservation of matter like they didn't just disappear they didn't you know they're not gone mm. they're not destroyed they can't be just that energy can't be destroyed so it's just in another form or in another space, we access it in a different way. And it's comforting to know that it must still be out there, even if we are struggling to, to locate it. Yeah. And then it becomes, uh, at least, um, it becomes like a puzzle to solve, not a despair. Where do the dreams go? Yeah, yeah. For me asking my, myself, like, where did my dreams go? It feels like, you know, I'm, I'm searching for my superpower. I've lost it. You know, I really feel like back when I was younger, my superpower were my dreams. Because that propelled so much of what I did. That drove me to do basically everything I did. And it kept me doing those things. So now kind of searching for that is feeling like, man, I lost my superpower. Where do they go? And I like what you said, yeah, like the conservation of energy. They're, they're somewhere. They're being utilized somewhere. Maybe that's stress. Maybe that's family stress. Maybe that's, I don't know, going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> I don't know. It's being used somewhere for sure. And so how do we redirect that energy, re take that power back and harness it and focus it towards something that can really help us achieve the goals we want to achieve? I think there's a there's an opportunity to do the zoom in zoom out thing here where if you imagine, you know, it all is a tai chi. If you zoomed in to a routine, you might find that there are some places where it's just limp. Mm -hmm. Right? If you watch somebody do tai chi, there are points where it's like the opposite of powerful. Just just empty and deflated and limp. And if you just froze that moment in the micro, you'd say like, well, this is, you know, this is, this is awful. Like there's, there's no, there's no grace. There's no beauty. This is just sunken cravenness. 
But when you zoom out and you see that moment of, whether you can call it weakness, as part of a flow, an ebb and a flow between incredible power and incredible strength and incredible fierceness and incredible drive contrasted with those those moments of stasis becomes a, a really beautiful thing. And it makes the superpower even more super and even more powerful to know that it's not always, the light's not always on. Maybe just a point of hope for, you know, all of us out there that go through the 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 low you know low points in the cycle just remember that it is a cycle if you zoom out far enough everything's a cycle yeah yeah for and, sure. um, as you say we uh, we still got we still got a lot of time on our clocks and it's cool to think about what the what the dreams in their newer form will look like even if we can't see them now but they're coming that's beautiful man yeah I hope so cheers cheers Thanks for listening. To support, please check out the links to our sponsors in the show notes, follow me on LinkedIn, and of course, subscribe to The Essence of Investing wherever you get your podcasts. With that, I'm signing off, your happy and humble host, Jonathan Rackman. See you next time.